Welcome to Quarren Lean, the show where we bring a little lean ensemble into your homes while we all wait for the moment when we can once again do it in the theater. I'm Blake White, and this is episode five of the online talk show, which means that I have been in this room by myself talking to a little white light on my computer for 10 weeks. Sometimes these posters talk to me, especially this one. In 2017, I was at the Theater Communications Group Fall Forum on Governance, along with our board president, Tony Award winner and person who does not miss hugs, Myla Lerner. The theme of this conference was one question. What are the stories that make up the fabric of the community in which you live? Independent of each other, Myla and I both scribbled down one word in our notes. Mitchellville. When I got home, I immediately contacted our director of new play development, Nick Newell, and we were off. Nick's first task was finding the writer who could tackle this ambitious project. Nick worked diligently and with great speed, and in the summer of 2018, we knew we found the person who could put Mitchellville up on stage. My guest today is an award-winning screenwriter, journalist, and playwright whose work has been seen in the Miami Herald, the New Republic, the Chicago Tribune, and ESPN. His television credits include This Is Us, Brain Dead, The Good Fight, and Evil. And he is a playwright whose work has been seen on stages from New York to Miami to Seattle to Toronto. And I have no idea why he's wasting his time talking to me. I am thrilled to be talking to the playwright of the new play, Mitchellville, Aaron Squire. Aaron, how are you? Doing great. Good. It's day here in Williamsburg and uh, just hanging out. Williamsburg, but you were down in Florida for most of the last few months, right? Yeah, for the last three months. Uh, play musical that was opening down at Miami New Drama got postponed. I just stayed down there with my uh, family. What brought you back up to New York? Was it just time to go home? Uh, I just, my spidey senses said that if I'm going to come back to Miami in August or September, I should go back to New York now. And right as I did, the rates flipped, the rates in New York plummeted, and now the rates in Florida are sky high. So it was just, I just had a sense that June 10th or 11th was like, oh, this is a time to leave. This feels like a good moment. Well, maybe if you came down to South Carolina, our rates would drop as well. Could you maybe do that for us? Exactly. If I just feel the the sense. You just feel that sense. I've lived in I've lived on Hilton Head for over ten years, but it is my estimation that Mitchellville, um, as a piece of history, has only in the last five years or so started really getting traction. Um, from the town to get that story out there. Had you heard of Mitchellville uh, as a piece of history, as a piece of land prior to us contacting you? No, not at all. That's what fascinated me about it. Because you're also a journalist, right? Yeah, my agent sent me the notice from Nick and I read that and I thought this is perfect. This is the gray area because I know slave plays are very popular and I have problems writing things that uh, direct where like one side's good, one side's bad. Uh, nothing sparks my interest as an artist and as a writer, unless I'm challenged too morally. And so I'm always looking for the gray area, which is hard with slavery narratives. There's no <laughs> yeah. gray. Uh, you know, let my people go. And it's like, but think about it. There's no like, <laughs> there's, there's no, no it's not Moses a lot of great. Being like, well, it's a complicated issue. We got to talk about hours. Um, <laughs> and so I was like, oh, this is the gray area. This is an area that was encircled by conflict where people are trying to build something and they're dealing with the past as well as a potential future, as well as a war and being in sort of a, an identity purgatory where they don't know how to claim themselves. So it was, it was perfect. What is the first thing that you do? Do you start looking at research on the Google? 
or do you start uh, going a little bit deeper than that? Or do you just want to figure out what the what this a framework of the actual bit of history before you dive into what your story that could be told might be? It depends upon my mood, but a lot of times I go to music. And so if you tell me a region, I'll just look up the music from that area and listen to it, look at some poetry, look at some stuff on YouTube, and then I want to get a feel of it. I want to circle around the issue before attacking it head on. I'm always trying to circle around and get a feel of the area so that I can world build because in theater, the world building happens with our language, mostly and how people talk, how people describe themselves, as opposed to film where you could just build a set and you can leave the world building to, you could come up with some ideas and the world building is done by production. So I'm always trying to create the world and then the people usually come out of the world or you create a person, a very charismatic person and you build the world around them. So it's either outside in or inside out is usually the way it goes. And in this case, since it's in the past, no one who's seeing this play was alive back then. I don't know how old your board members are, but no one was alive back then. And so there's no one who's gonna be like, that's not the way that was done. Uh, and so I'm trying to build <laughs> around the, the feel of the world. And then the character starts sprouting out of that feel. I'm sweating again. <laughs> how did you come up with the idea of taking a present day Hilton Head and the Mitchellville of the post-Civil War era and telling them in the same play within the parameters of a theater, a, a theatrical piece. I wanted there to be some presence of what's going on now and the link to history because when I was there, it felt like a uh, history was being lost and in a very tenu tenuous uh, place. So I wanted to create a thread, even though most of the story is set in the past, I want there to be a link to the property and the land that's in transit uh, going on right now with a lot of Gullah Geechee people fighting over their rights, losing land because of tax uh, laws, and that fascinates me. Uh, and so I figured if I could come up with a thread of intentions and obstacles that keeps the present moment going, we can drop into the richness of the past. And I, if I just wrote something that was in the past and it begins and it's the 1800s and it ends and it's the 1800s, you're watching it, but it feels like it's, there's that extra layer of detachment because mm -hmm. you're watching it. Yes, yeah, 1800s, we know how the story ends, you know? But also your play, without you know, giving too much away, your play occurs post-Emancipation Proclamation, correct? Yes. So I was but not everything's all clean and great. Exactly. I was and so not only is not everything all clean and great then, it's not all clean and great now, because that is the world in which we live. So, so people are celebrating something that they think is a doorway opening. And it is a new doorway that is opening up. But every time you step through a doorway, it, it causes a new set of problems and issues once you're in that new room and in that new arena. And what's going on right now presumably we're gonna step through another doorway. And the hopeful idealist thinks, once I step through, everything's gonna be different. And a lot of things are, and then usually some baggage is carried over into the new, into the new room. So I feel like uh, that period in time in American history, there were a lot of passages and doorways people were moving through. Uh, and we're still carrying some of that baggage today as we move through another doorway. You didn't know anybody here when you came here on your research week, correct? So how do you go about uh, diving into a story like this, especially a story that um, a lot of people take very proud ownership of, uh, that don't want it to be uh, told insensitively or improperly or unfactually? I think everything that I research and everything that I need is in the room and everything that I'm gonna use is on the journey. So coming there, I arrived and I found out that my license had expired because I live in New York. Who cares about a driver's license? Uh, and I have Can a passport. you drive my car for like a week? Yeah, but, <laughs> but no, like I, I didn't have a license. My license was expired. So I had to go get a new license. In order to get a new license, I needed to get seen by an optometrist because I wear glasses. 
So I went to the Walmart and I had to sit there and I'm sitting there in the optometrist office in the Walmart and hearing people just talk. And I'm just bringing, taking in that information. So the optometrist sees me and he starts talking about ghosts and the history of ghosts in South Carolina. And I just start recording him. And I was like, do you mind if I just record this? It's like, sure. And like, so that was a part of the research. I didn't know when I landed that I would need a new license, which would require me going to an optometrist's office where I would meet other people, where the doctor would be talking about the history of ghosts in South Carolina. But if I'm open enough, things like that, the happy coincidences will happen. I just speak the truth and occasionally people listen. Uh, so when I was at Juilliard in 2013, 2014, 2015, when Ferguson happened, all of a sudden people wanted me to write articles for the New Republican Talking Parts memo about race. I had been speaking my truth, it's just that it caught on. And then after 2015, 2016, uh, people fell back asleep. And so it went away. Uh, but the truth travels underground. And I feel like the power of the writer and the storyteller is our stories travel underground even when people aren't listening. And then they spring up like a well that's been struck during certain moments. But the power of that well means that it's been flowing even when you're not looking. So the idea of Mitchellville has been flowing longer than you and me, and people have been carrying the story on, and then we just hit on it and it springs up, all this information springs up. No matter, what, no matter how good any of us are, plays are not meant to be read. Yes. Plays are meant to be heard. And there is no environment, there is no imagination that can bring to a play uh, what a group of 10 or 15 really good artists can bring to it. You might not, you might not agree with all choices, right? But you're going to learn from even choices you disagree with. Do you think that's a fair statement? Yeah, I, I learned so much from actors and I wish I could just write a play like a book, close it and be like, and the end. I finished. Uh, I have not had that experience yet because usually I'm working with good actors and they discover something and then I'm like, oh, I have to rewrite it. And then you rip out the guts and then you discover something else hidden even deeper that you were really talking about the whole time. And when you're writing a play for a few weeks or a few months, you're working in a meditative process where your mind is on and off again, thinking about something for months. So you're putting out stuff that you're not even aware of until you examine it again. You're writing little lines and little gestures and little moments. Uh, and I've learned to respect those little moments. Some of them I understand, or I think I understand what they are. Some of them I don't at all, but they just stir something in me viscerally. And I go, this means something I haven't figured it out yet. The gesture. Uh, and then other things I'm like, fill in blank. This is a moment here. I don't know what it is, but something needs to happen and uh, we'll figure it out there. And so- It sounds like that, you're, you're saying that you let it live underground until it yeah, hurts. It has to come up. And when anyone who's writing something for an extended period of time, you are operating on a meditative deep level where you are unconsciously and subconsciously saying stuff that you're not even fully aware of until you look at it later. You go, oh, and so that's a process of development and workshops in the best case scenario is that it brings those out and then you can adjust the meters and the levels and the layers. So uh, we're gonna see you in October. I will see you before then. And uh, thank you for being a part of this for the last uh, bit of time talking to us here in the Low Country of South Carolina. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to it. Well, that's it for this episode of Corn Lane. And I wanna thank my guest, Aaron Squire. I also want to thank our production sponsor for this episode, Curry Printing, for all your local printing needs. And as always, gratitude and thanks to our producer, Erica Kramer over at Sleeves Up Productions. My apologies for running out of time to the screenwriter of Jurassic Park, as well as Mission Impossible, David Kep. I flew in for this in a mask. His next one, Untitled Indiana Jones Project, sounds like a hoot. Well, we'll see you again in two weeks, everybody. And until then, stay safe 
stay healthy, and most importantly, stay sane.